Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this cyber seminar series, Navigating Beyond Academic Waters with AGU H3S, um, Expectations, Collaborations, and Service. Before I hand things off to our speakers and uh, conveners for today, I wanted to give a brief overview of Quasi while folks are still logging on. My name is Julia Masterman, my pronouns are she, her, uh, and I'm the Education Outreach Specialist for Quasi which stands for the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. We're a nonprofit organization funded primarily by the National Science Foundation. And our mission is to empower the water community and advance science through collaboration, infrastructure, and education. We seek to fulfill this mission through a number of different activities, um, primarily our data services, um, which include two data repositories, HydroShare and uh, HIS, the hope is that by providing um, support and infrastructure, uh, Quasi can help researchers formulate and execute their data management plans, be effective data stewards, and meet the requirements of funding agencies. We also provide a number of community services or education and outreach services, which include grants, workshops, a summer institute with the National Water Center for graduate students, webinar series and events like this one, a virtual university and more. Um, you can also find us at many conferences throughout the year. If you are planning on attending the AGU fall meeting, come find us. We'll have a booth in the exhibit hall. Um, we'd love to see you. So with that, uh, thank you so much to our conveners at AGU H3S um, for putting together this series of webinars. Uh, this has been the third in a series this fall um, and the last of this series. So thank you so much to everyone and to Paige and Adam specifically uh, this week for inviting our fantastic speakers. Before we get started, a few logistics. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel. Secondly, we ask that you use the Q&A functionality to submit questions to our speakers. Please feel free to uh, start asking questions whenever you would like. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and finally, we expect that all involved with quasi cyber seminars and events uphold the quasi code of conduct and promote and maintain a professional, considerate, respectful, and collaborative virtual environment. So thank you for being a part of that. And with that, I will pass the mic on to Paige Becker. Thank you. Let's see. All right, hi all. Um, my name is Paige Becker, she, her, and I am the current chair for AGU H3S, which is the Hydrology Section Student and Early Career Subcommittee. Um, we're a group of motivated students and early career scientists who strive to provide a student and early career hydrologists with opportunities for professional development, as well as social internet interaction, networking within the broader ge geosciences community. Um, this webinar is just one of the many things that we do throughout the year. Um, we've also put together like first-timers guides for AGU attendees. Um, we've put together various blog posts on resources, including a water person of color database where you can look for potential seminar speakers um, that are people of color that are in the water sciences and much more. Um, because we are talking here about service, one of the things I wanted to point you all to is that there are there is a service opportunity within H3S right now. So um, applications are open and we're looking for members who want to bring fresh ideas to H3S and are enthusiastic about supporting our existing initiatives. Um, so again, right now we have applications that are open. They will be closing December 31st. If you are a student or early career member in the hydrologic sciences, we encourage you to apply, be part of our program. Um, feel free to go to our website as well, agu-h3s.org if you have any questions. And then lastly, we'll also be at AGU. Yeah, so I'll take care of this slide here. Um, my name is Adam Price. I'm the chair elect for um, the H3S committee. So I'll be starting my, my chair term at the beginning of 2025 and taking over for Paige. Um, but at AGU this year, which is um, one of our um, kind of pre, uh, programming um, op offerings as well um, to this. Uh, we will be having a, a booth again this year in the exhibition hall that's a it's a little more on the, the kind of main avenue. So come see us at booth 746. And I think Quasi will just be a couple booths down from us. Um, we also have a couple of different um, technical sessions as well that we're going to be having. And so 
Um, we have a, a town hall that's uh, navigating research collaborations as an early career and student researcher on Monday. Um, we have our second annual Thinking Outside the Box plot um, session that went really well last year. Some, some great presentations thinking about non-traditional ways or unique ways or um, uh, more interesting ways to communicate your science beyond a manuscript. And then we have our Jedi focus session um, that will be on Wednesday that's about centering diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the geosciences um, and looking at the, and celebrating success stories in education research to address critical societal issues. So those are some of our programming things that we have. Come see us at the booth all week. We'd love to talk to you. There'll be different people um, stopping by. Maybe some some of our panelists as well will be able to, to, to join us there. So that's what we have going on this year. All right. Thanks all. Um, so I guess we're going to get started now and would love for our panelists to just take a few minutes to introduce themselves, um, kind of talk, talk about their experience with service and, you know, why they got into service. Um, so Leho, I'll start with you. Awesome. Thank you, Paige and Adam. And thanks for the opportunity to reflect on this with you all. Um, when I got the invitation to do this, I was coming back from sabbatical. And so it was a really good time to sort of take stock of what I thought about service. And I actually went ahead and put together a slide um, that I wanna share with you all. So I'm gonna share my screen now and I hope that you all can see this. Um, and so this slide sort of represents my thinking and my reflection um, of my own service, kind of both looking backwards and looking forward um, as I sort of continue in this next sort of, um, post sabbatical mesocycle, as you might call it. So uh, I really think of service as a as a portfolio, right? It's often the case in your career where you're doing service um, on more than one front at the same time. Um, so, um, right, uh, you're oftentimes gonna have kind of multiple potentially competing things that you're doing service for. Um, and it's really important to sort of be mindful and reflective um, of those service obligations and, and authentic in them. And so what I wanna do now is kind of review kind of a few lenses through which I think about doing service and service obligations, um, reflect on some of the existing and previous service that I've done, and just give you a couple of takeaways that are just purely from my perspective um, about things that you might wanna think about when you're considering a new service, um, service role. So uh, I tend to think of service as kind of falling into perhaps three buckets. There might be more, but this is sort of, you know, three is a nice, um, easy number to sort of think about, right? And that is service that's obligatory, right? Service that you must do, service that you are assigned to do by a superior as part of your, your job position, service that's strategic, Right, so service that advances some longer term air aim, and that could be for your career, for some program that you're affiliated with, for an institution, or for a larger community, and service that's enriching, right? And so this is service that provides you meaning beyond kind of the simple metrics, right? Beyond, um, you know, kind of something that you're going to put on a CV. This is service that is personally meaningful to you. And ideally, when you're undertaking service roles, right, they would hopefully, you know, fall in the overlap between at least two of those kind of buckets, right, the Venn diagram. Um, and, you know, those service obligations that fall at the intersection of all of them are just, you know, really great, but they could be sort of few and far between, right? So, um, on my kind of Venn diagram of obligatory, strategic, and enriching service, I've kind of put a few different service roles that I've had, those that are in red are service obligations that are concluded. Um, and those that are in green are service obligations that I uh, still are, am currently committed to. And I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I'm gonna touch on just a couple of them um, to sort of identify sort of how they break out in terms of this obligation uh, or in, in terms of how they break out on this Venn diagram, right? So. Um, for instance, my opportunity to serve on a couple of different National Academies reports, right? One um, was a decadal survey for the NSF um, Earth Sciences Directorate. Another one was for the future of water quality on Lake Coeur d'Alene. 
those were really enriching opportunities. They provided meaningful service at a national level. They were about very important topics that are, you know, really kind of I'm passionate about in my career that I'm, you know, very interested in. But they're also strategic, right? They they um, hopefully help advance, for instance, the critical zone community in my, you know, in my role on the um, Earth and Time National Academies report, or raising the level of knowledge about um, water quality issues in Lake Coeur d'Alene um, at the national scale, right? So they advance some some interest that's sort of broader than kind of just just myself, right? Um, at the same time, right, you might think of uh, um, service roles that sort of fit in just a single box, right? So um, my current role as student uh, faculty advisor for the student American Water Resources chapter here at Boise State University, right? Um, I'm not really sort of pushing anything, right? There's no sort of strategic aim for that for that committee. It's not an obligation. I wasn't told to do it, but I find it very enriching precisely because it allows me to interact with a lot of our early career, um, a lot of our early career and and you know current graduate students in the department. So it's a way of interacting with those students that's not um, in the classroom and not in a research setting, and it's a way to sort of help them along with their careers. So um, with all of that kind of reflection, I think that there's just a few things that you might want to keep in mind um, uh, as you consider what service obligations or what service roles you might want to take on. Um, and that is when you're considering a service role, you should be able to answer, you know, why am I doing this role at this time, right? Is this, is this for a strategic re reasons? Is this, you know, to be personally enriching or am I being assigned to do this? Um, and then, as I think a lot of our panelists will probably say, right, you need to really figure out whether or not you have the time to do this. Um, and then, you know, you also want to sort of um, understand, and it's it's hard to do this frequently when you're um, in your early career, that no now is not no forever, right? You can gracefully say no to things in the short term um, with the idea of potentially saying yes to that obligation in the future. And I think along those lines, it's really helpful to potentially, you know, practice saying no and practice saying no in an authentic way, right? Don't just say, I don't have time for this right now, right? Um, be thoughtful and reflective in, um, in those times when you're going to say no to a service obligation and practice saying that with kind of another colleague or um, a friend or somebody that you can sort of confide in. So um, I'll stop there and I look forward to um, any questions in the discussion afterwards. So thank you. Thanks, Leho. Uh, Laura, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Paige. Um, I'm so glad you did because I was just scribbling down Leho's Venn diagram and noting that your NSF service was not on the diagram, Leho. So just, just a suggested editorial comment. <laughs> and it would be right in the center of your Venn diagram. Anyway, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Lautz, and I'm a program director at the National Science Foundation. Um, so Basically, my job right now is I, I am a federal government employee, and I run a grant program at the National Science Foundation called Hydrologic Sciences, and my role is to uh, work with PIs to help them navigate the NSF system and think about their research and how they may apply for funding through the National Science Foundation. And I also manage you know, the review of proposals. So finding reviewers for proposals, finding panelists, making award and decline decisions, and then communicating with PIs about how that process went and um, you know, help them interpret the results and think about where they wanna go with their research. So I think my role is very service oriented right now, um, but also my job is also <laughs> to convince others about the importance of service because I'm 100% reliant on the research community to do voluntary service in order to have the whole system work. And so they have to see the value in it, I think, in order to be participants. Um, so so uh, Paige and Adam posed the question for us to prepare of kind of why, why we value service or why, um, why we serve the community in the ways that we do. So. Um, I, before coming to the National Science Foundation, I was a faculty member and, uh, you know, I had my own research program and was working in maybe a role somewhat similar to what Leho was describing in terms of the types of service that I would do as a faculty member. 
And a lot of folks have asked me five years ago, I moved from that position to the National Science Foundation and a lot of people had the why. So I feel like I've, I've answered this question a little bit and I'm happy to convey that to all of you. Um, I, I came to NSF because I think I found as a faculty member, I mean, I really enjoyed research and I really enjoyed what I was doing, but I was also doing more um, administrative and service work like the roles Leho was describing. And I was really enjoying those. And I felt like this transition to NSF would be a great way to kind of you know, kick that into overdrive. So I think the, you know, the reason I'm at the National Science Foundation, no longer doing my own research, but trying to serve the research community is one, I, you know, based on my own experience as a faculty member, I feel that the, the National Science Foundation and the review process and the whole, you know, power of making awards and delivering decline decisions to PIs is extremely important. And so I feel like, um, you know, when you feel something is really important, instead of hoping others kind of do it well, maybe you just dive in and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that and try to ensure it's a robust process. So, you know, the things that really motivate me at work every day are, you know, I know how hard PIs work on proposals and, you know, it's a labor of love. They may have worked a year or two on something and they send it in and it's like you're caring for this thing that they have worked so hard on. And so I wanna make sure that the decisions made on that proposal are evidence-based and rational um, and that there we're make, recommending awards for truly the most, the projects that have the most merit and the greatest societal impact or potential for that, you know, to be realized. Um, you know, it also motivates me to be accountable to the taxpayer. So like when I go to Thanksgiving this year and uh, talk to my family about my work and their, where their tax dollars are going, you know, making them feel confident that it's a robust process and, you know, we're, we're, we're responsible with taxpayer dollars, um, with your dollars, you're all taxpayers. So, you know, you should expect a lot of your federal agencies to manage those dollars. And I wanna make sure um, that I give good feedback or that a program gives good feedback to PIs really so they can understand what the review process was like for their proposal, what the feedback was, make sure that feedback is constructive and helpful um, and yields good outcomes, regardless of whether the decision was an award or decline. There's always good that can come from the review process, even if it's not you know, the award decision people were specifically hoping for, they can still get useful feedback. And then the final thing that really motivates me is to ensure that you know, the broadest spectrum of research researchers know about NSF and feel like they can engage with NSF and they see a place for themselves at NSF because we're very committed at the foundation to ensuring participation of the entire cross-section of researchers across the US. And so, you know, how can I make sure that people can see a place for themselves at NSF by, you know, being transparent and available and, you know, yeah, filling that service role, right? Ser serving them and, and helping them navigate the system. So I think I'll leave it there. And thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Krista, go ahead. Hi, I'm Krista Kelleher. I'm an assistant professor at Lafayette College, which is a primarily undergraduate institution. Um, my service sounds similar to Leho's with some differences. Um, I also spent time before this at an R1 institution for a number of years. And so um, I've sort of seen service roles in the transition from those two types of institutions. Um, my service right now, probably my biggest service roles are um, serving as part of the technical committee, uh, the hydrology technical committee on catchment hydrology. Um, I also am an associate editor at both hydrological processes and um, the journal Hess out of EGU. Um, those two roles look very different in those different places. Um, and then at Lafayette, uh, I am a smiling and friendly person, and I found that means I get asked to do lots and lots of things. So at the present moment, I focus on service roles that directly benefit my students. So if something does not directly benefit my undergraduate students, um, I say no to it. And if it does, I sort of try to pause and think about it and usually say yes, because I am a yes person. I'm working on that. I'm, I'm in recovery. 
Um, so three of my big service roles in the department, one is that I support our students that are taking the fundamentals of engineering exam to get technical licensure. Um, so I help coordinate with them how to review and prepare for that. Um, I support our undergraduate. Um, we have a program for women and women identifying students who are pursuing research in engineering. So I work a lot with that group. Um, and I also coordinate community lunches for our civil engineering students about every month. So a lot of those roles are really interacting with students, which is something that I personally find enjoyable. Um, I will say the other part of service that I really enjoy is um, supporting individuals as they move through um, academia and figure out whether or not academia is for them. So um, sometimes you might hear the term invisible service and I wouldn't call it invisible. I would just call it, you gotta put it on your resume or CV. So I do a lot of mentoring of early career individuals. Um, I do a lot of reading of statements for people applying for faculty positions, just because I have found that is something I really enjoy helping individuals to figure out what that looks like. So I think an important thing I will add here is there are sort of formalized service roles. And there are also a lot of sort of less formal service roles that still matter and might be something that you really enjoy and that um, are important things to, to quantify if that is a part of your job or role in, in whatever industry, academia, um, or professional capacity you serve. And with that, I will hand it over to our last panelist. Yeah, go ahead, Heather, and introduce oh, my yourself. Up. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Heather Golden. I work with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in a specific section called the Office of Research and Development. So we all do research within the office I work in. So I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I really loved all of the introductory information you all provided, and I can see a lot of what I do and what each of you do, too. Um, so um, I'm thinking of Leho's um, Venn diagram. And as a public employee, I, I have kind of an obligatory um, service just being part of the EPA, which is a federally funded agency. Um, and I, I actually targeted doing um, that at going out of grad school. So I really wanted to work with a federal agency doing research um, just to kind of do more applied research in a giving back kind of way as much as you can. Um, and so within that organization to within EPA, I also um, do similar things that Chris was saying. I, I mentor um, actually grad students sometimes just trying to look at the federal workplace and thinking about how they might get into that world. Um, and just also just committees within, um, these are more obligatory, committees within EPA that we have to you know do strategic planning. But um, outside of that, um, similar to Chris, I'm a chair of a, a technical committee at AGU. It's a water quality technical committee. I'm also um, an associate editor for water resources research and frontiers in the environment and ecology in the, in the environment. Um, and so those are kind of more in the strategic enriching realm. Um, it's, uh, yeah, really it's lovely to just be able to look at other research that's coming to the fore and thinking through new methods and looking how people are doing really cool things. And um, it, that has been really great. And that's actually just been in the past year and a half or so for uh, water resources research, the other journal, um, Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, I've done for a few years. But that's a, a really, really um, cool, fun role to play. So um, I'll just let it at that because I think there's a lot of questions that are coming up and we can, I'll close it there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you all for um, the introductions. And uh, Leho, I think your slide was a good uh, good prop for everybody to kind of plug in their own their own um, service uh, commitments as well. Um, just to kind of to lead off with a question, and then we'll get to some of the questions in the in the Q and A. Um, one thing that I was curious about is, you know, we we do have to say no to to service commitments, and mostly that's because of time. That's not necessarily because of um, of interest. And so how do you um, recommend folks balance service with work um, commitments or, or their research? And so is that kind of 
you know, feeding two birds with one hand with trying to to overlap some of those? Or is that, you know, really setting hard boundaries? What what ways have you found in each one of your kind of service and, and balance uh, and maintaining that balance? I mean, anybody can kind of pick this up. So feel free to unmute and, and jump in. I'm just going to jump in and say one of the choices I've been making, maybe this is the privilege of being a little bit like in the mid-career phase, but maybe it's not. So I'm just going to throw it out there. If you're not super excited about the prospect of doing whatever service X you've been offered, um, maybe that's where um, I think Leho said this, like you can say no now for the potential later, because you will find a way to organize your time for that something you're really excited about. But if you feel like it's just a, a drag, it's going to be a real drag <laughs> through the whole, you know, so just kind of think about your choices first. And then the balancing part is just, um, it's some things just take time. And that'll probably be something I keep saying, like time through your career of how to manage your time. But even blocking off times on your calendar to say in these two hours, I'm going to work on, you know, the service of whatever X you're doing. And that might be a way to do it too. So it's two recommendations are, be super excited about what you say yes to and um, block off calendar time, physical calendar time for that service then if you can, if you have the privilege to do that. Yeah, just um, to, to riff on something Heather just said, right? I, I think one thing that's really important um, that all of us might underscore is when somebody offers you an opportunity to sort of serve in some capacity, um, you should definitely ask questions about how much time this entails, right? If it's going to be um, uh, an associate editor position, right? How many papers am I going to have to deal with and manage um, on a monthly basis, right? So really drill down and try to get a good sense of how much time commitment you're, you're actually signing up for. Um, the other thing that I'll say too is that, um, you know, especially for those that maybe, um, maybe, thinking about longer term and, and those of us that are in kind of uh, mid-career positions um, and leadership positions, um, you, you like to hope for or aspire to have some um, people assigning you service positions that, um, although they may not sort of spark joy, right, they're taking your time into consideration. And so an example of that from that, that was on that, um, on that Venn diagram slide was, Serving in the college awards committee, um, that was a very early career thing that um, I did. It was maybe in my first or second year. And my department chair actually said, you know, I'm I'm signing, you know, I, I, I need you to do this. I need I need somebody on this committee from geosciences from my department. And the reason that I'm signing you up for this is because it's a really small commitment. You'll meet like one time over the semester for you know maybe two hours max and then that's your service role for this this semester so um, you want to cultivate some supervisors that sort of are looking out for you in that way and then ultimately when you become a supervisor right you you want to a think about your people's time and kind of managing it effectively and also kind of explaining to them like this sounds like it's not going to be fun and it might not be fun but it's only you know two hours of not fun over the course of an entire semester or year Were you going to answer this, Krista? You should go first. I feel like those were both two really great answers. Um, I will add uh, maybe to, to Heather's points, um, one tiny thing, which is, I mean, just building on that same idea. Um, if you're not excited about it, don't do it. Give yourself 24 hours before you say yes. I am bad at that, <laughs> but it's really good advice. Um, the second part, I think, of that is is building on what Leho says. The title of a role, um, depending on what context it's in, um, may involve different types of service. So um, my associate editor position at Hess looks very different than my associate editor position at um, hydrological processes. So I think some people are like, oh my gosh, how are you doing that at both places? They have very different expectations um, associated with those roles. Um, and then third, I think is, is if you're unsure, uh, find a good mentor, find a good uh, person to bounce ideas off of and say, is, is this a good idea? Will this help me? Do you think this is a good idea? Still make the decision yourself, but um, having some individuals to bounce ideas off of is good. Um, Laura, you're up. 
I'll be brief, but I was going to flip it from a different perspective because, of course, I'm the person who needs everybody to say yes to everything. And so let me just just chime in to say, although that's true, you should always say yes. That's actually not true. And I have a few just things kind of if if you're invited to if you were invited to review an NSF proposal or maybe this applies broadly to reviewing or things where I will admit I'm not sure that every time I send a proposal review request the person on the other end is is excited to do it but they do often say yes so why do they do that and I think a few things like hopefully you're being asked to review things that are of interest to you and the program officer or the editor like Krista is editing a journal um, has has really done their homework to try to find, like there's a logical reason why someone is sending it to you. And maybe it's actually um, kind of speaking to your expertise and your qualifications. And maybe even as a sign of flattery that we really wanna know, hey, what do you think about this? Cause you're the expert and you know. Um, I also think sometimes it is important to say yes to service that you yourself rely on. So for example, if you're someone who submits NSF proposals, like I'm hoping you'll also review them. And maybe if you're submitting journal articles, it might, might be good to take on a few of those, you know, to kind of be a team player because um, we're all relying on that peer review process. And it can be a great learning experience. You know, a lot of folks say, how can I write a great NSF proposal? I'm like, review, if you review a few, you quickly, you know, put yourself in the mindset of a reviewer and maybe figure out how to speak to them. But I also do want to emphasize for folks out there, you can say no. And it's interesting when when you're on the flip side of asking people to do service, especially as someone who maybe was too much of a yes person, people do say no, and you should feel comfortable saying no if you need to. Um, and I think if you were to ask me like what a reasonable load, it, like you might ask your colleagues, what, how many journal articles should I be reviewing a year? How many proposals? You know, I would be happy if people were willing to review like two or three proposals a year. I'd be super excited about that. And so if you find you're doing a lot more than that, you know, you should feel comfortable saying no. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to maybe from the flip side, if you're out there and you're getting an email from me and you need to say no, um, that's okay. And it's, and no one's going to hold that against you. And you can say yes later, like Leho said, right? No, now is not no forever. Awesome. Thanks, Elle. Um, We had a great question in the chat that I want to open up to all of you. Um, someone said she's participated in some service work during grad school and other periods of her um, research career. And she said some of the initiatives have failed, such as low engagement, low attendance during the activity, you know, not sustainable long term impact, which can be really discouraging and wish there's more spaces to explore what service works and, you know, how do we improve the ones that don't. Um, how have you all overcome some of these feelings, if you have felt them and persevered for this important work. And with that, are there, um, you know, are there strategies that you have found to be successful in helping maintain certain service efforts? Um. Oh, go ahead, Heather. Mm, I was just going to reiterate the question since we were in quiet, but you go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Amanda, that's a really great question. And I, I think all of us have sort of experienced that, right? Like trying to sort of launch something that sort of fizzles. Um, and at the very top, I would just say kudos for you for taking the risk for doing that, right? Like it is, um, you do sort of make yourself vulnerable when you're sort of trying to create something new and sort of and it doesn't sort of work out the way um, the way you thought it would. Um, I would just say, like a really, I, I think this goes back to um, maybe a comment that that Krista and or Heather made about um, cultivating mentors, right? Um, is it's really good to have um, a set of folks, you know, both inside your institution and outside your institution, that you can go to with that question of like, hey, you know, I. I, I wanted to have this kind of event or I wanted to propose this session at, at AGU or, you know, um, and I didn't get the attendance that I sort of thought, right, that I would, right? I didn't get the sort of, you know, the the enthusiastic feedback that I was kind of looking for. Um, and, you know, helpful mentors will sort of walk you through all of that and say like, oh, well, you know, you had a long, I, this, I'm guilty of this, so I'll fess up to this, right? Like you had a long title for that 
session proposal. And so people probably didn't know what it was or, right, uh, maybe it was at the same time as, as something else. Um, and so I think like being able to kind of have that network of people that you can go to and sort of ask like, you know, how could I have modified this or how could I, how could this have been better will sort of help you calibrate that for future experiences. And I think that that is huge, right? So I wouldn't, I'd hope that you would sort of continue taking the risk to sort of be out there and trying new things. Um, and I think that helping, you know, having a mentoring sort of uh, a, net, a network of mentors can sort of help you make sure that you're iterating towards, you know, impactful service. I think that's a super good point, Leho. And, and and when you say um kind of a, a cohort of mentors, I, I'm guessing some people are also thinking, how do I do that? How do I even make that cohort of mentors or whatever? And so um that that actually struck me because I know it was a it was a tough one for the first few years of my own career. Like, whoa. so um I again I'm gonna emphasize it takes time and just keeping your eye open to opportunities. And um, the good thing is, I think that's a bit different than like maybe when I graduated from grad school was I think there's more people that are like un in the mid-career now that are more open to mentoring and looking at things in a different way, um, out bit outside of the box, you know, not just an academic career, but this and that. Anyhow, um, but it is, it is that in itself is a challenge, you know, you've got to build that mentor group first and then I think it's an awesome idea then you go to that group and you know what could I do different and stuff so I don't know if we'll get into that the actual developing networks um to get these opportunities of service but it just it flipped the switch when you said that that's a really good idea Yeah, Laura and Chris, I don't know if you have anything to to add to that. Um, if not, we could we can move on to next. I think Paige, actually, you have your hand up. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing, Laura and Krista. That's fine. We can we can move on to the next one. Um, I think uh, one of the questions that um, uh, was answered in the chat, but uh, maybe to bring back up specifically for this for this group in H3S, um, one of the attendees asked, as a grad student, what type of service do you recommend students getting into if they have not done any service yet? Um, how and where should they look to find service opportunities? And what service do you wish you would have done or not have done uh, during grad school? And I think you know, I'll hog the mic here as I ask, ask the question as well. I'll, I'll put a plug in for H3S. Um, you know, we're always looking for, for folks to come in, especially this time of year. This is when we have our, our membership um, applications open, and we do have a very robust um, portfolio of service opportunities that range from, you know, a, a pretty heavy um, time commitment um, where you're really interacting with kind of some of the AGU administration with planning events and sessions um, and thinking about, you know, budgets and things like that to other commitments that are, um, you know, updating our social media or, or doing some of our other kind of um, science communication outreach things as well. So I would say we offer a, a really good service opportunity, but I'll, I'll defer to the, to the panelists for, for other suggestions as well. I guess I will maybe pick, hop in first um, and say, uh, reviewing papers is sort of an interesting question in grad school. And I'm sure others will have thoughts on this as well. Um, I, rem I started reviewing papers in my last year of my PhD um, was the first time I sort of felt comfortable doing that. Um, something that I did with a mentor that was really helpful uh, was to review, co-review a paper with them. So if that's a type of service you're interested in um, and you've started to publish a little bit and have seen the publication process, um, that is an option to sort of go through that process with an advisor, with a mentor, um, see what it looks like. Uh, I think all of us that are associate editors on this call would would welcome additional reviewers uh, and we're sort of happy to work with you on, on um, that process and what that looks like. And I know 
um, several journals are starting to offer trainings on the peer review process. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I was going to add one, one, I was trying to think of service I did as a graduate student, and I have to admit, I probably didn't do as much maybe as I should have, but I think I wasn't very savvy to knowing what I should do. But one thing that I did do that I look back on, I'm really glad that I did, is um, host a topical session at a professional meeting. So like hosting a session at GSA or AGU or whatever professional society meeting, it could be a regional meeting. Um, and the reason I found that really useful is... Um, I think I was trying to kind of figure out how to join like a community of researchers around certain topics, like, you know, maybe the catchment science community or the groundwater community or biogeochemistry community. You know, how do you like establish those connections when you are, you know, you may maybe haven't even, you know, published a paper yet. It's hard, it's hard to like let people know what you are thinking about. And I found hosting a session, um, you know, there's no better way to meet uh, a researcher you want to meet than asking them to give a presentation in your session because everyone loves to get that kind of invitation. And then they, you know, I do think they always remember, oh yeah, that was that person that invited me to give a talk at that session. And, and you know, it creates kind of a warm relationship. And then you get a chance to talk to them a lot during the meeting. And you're also sitting in the front of the room for an entire afternoon where the topic is, you know, heat as a tracer and hydrologic systems. And you know, it's it's like you 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 can sort of insert yourself into a field, and I also found that I didn't think it was a huge amount of wor work. Um, maybe it depends on the professional society meeting, but it was basically you know organizing the abstracts, trying to make kind of a logical sequence of talks, um, going through the poster session and interacting with the people who had submitted posters, thanking them for submitting to your session, and so. Um, you know, if people are thinking about that, I would encourage you to do it. I just found it a great way to network. That didn't, I didn't, I could just do it and I didn't have to rely on like my mentor to be a conduit for networking. I could sort of just create that opportunity myself by hosting that session. So that was something like in hindsight, I'm really glad that I did and I didn't even realize would be that valuable at the time. I'll just follow up um, Laura's comments about, um, th it's also a, a very similar form of service, but um, some departments will have engaged their students in helping to organize departmental and sort of college or programmatic seminars. That's another great opportunity because similarly, right, you're getting to extend an invitation often, um, right, in a way that's very kind of honorific for people, right? Um, it's, it's fun to be sort of have your airfare and your hotels paid for and you know, brought out to some kind of cool place, um, right, and get to know people. But um, you do get, right, some, it's a way to get to know um, some, um, somebody in fields of study that you're interested in, right, um, people that are publishing papers and doing science that you find interesting, that you would like to share with kind of your program and your department. Um, and it's a really great way to kind of uh, get to know those people um, on a more one-to-one -one basis. If you're kind of transitioning maybe to a postdoc position, right? It's a way to cultivate potential postdoc mentors. It's a way to cultivate multi uh, mentors more generally as well. So that would be, I, I did that as a graduate student. Um, I was fortunate to be able to spend my advisors and other faculties money in the department to bring out a great group of people. And um, it really made a big difference um, for me. And to find more opportunities too, um, like small, there's small conferences like the Gordon Catchment Conference that's happening this June. One small ones like that. I mean, I know, and even the um, oh, what is that called before AGU? The one Jim Kirchner holds every year. Um, shoot, does anyone? anyone? The Berkeley, uh, yeah, the Berkeley, Berkeley Catchment, Catchment Symposium. Yeah. yeah, those really small things like that is where you really get the opportunity, you know, you have lunch, and you don't know anybody, well, you're going to find somebody to sit with and talk to, you know, so it's going to kind of help you build that network again, to get to these service opportunities. Like it's just, because I, I, I think I'm emphasizing that because I, it took me a while to build a network. So um, it, it's really looking for opportunities like that, where gradually you don't even know it. It's kind of like what Laura said, you look back, you're like, wow, I'm glad I did that because it, it all gradually builds towards something, all these small things you're doing. But if you can get to settings where you do have that interaction like that, those small conferences or breakoffs from AGU, 
Um, that's really good. And ADU sessions, like Laura said, those are tricky sometimes because so many people submit them. So I would definitely have, you know, play that off of somebody that you trust that has been successful with them because otherwise it's kind of like, uh, they just kind of go in and get merged with somebody else. But then that can be good too, because then you're, again, have a session and now you're meeting new people and stuff too. So I diverge. So. Thanks all. Uh, we got another question. So Laura, to your experience in grad school of not really getting involved in service at that point, um, would you recommend getting involved in service as a grad student? And what transferable skills do graduate students inherently do, such as like being a TA um, that may be invisible, but might be important for us to recognize and are worth like quantifying as service? And also, how would you suggest navigating mentorship beyond the primary advisor, particularly if the advisor isn't leading those connections? There's a lot of questions in there, um, and I'm so I'll try I'll do my best, and then I hope my co co panelists will, will weigh in here. Um, would I recommend getting involved in service as a graduate student? I mean, I think I guess I would. I think I, I um, as I mentioned, I wasn't very intentional about it. I don't think I had very good guidance about what I should you know should be doing in terms of service, um, but I think. Going back to the advice you've already heard from others on the panel, like if if it's something you're excited about, if it's something you get value out, I mean, we're, you know, I would encourage you to to do it to have kind of a well-rounded portfolio, of both research, teaching, and service. Right? Those are kind of the three, especially if you're interested in pursuing an academic-related career. And so, I think a you know, there's always balance to be had, but I think doing some level of service and finding maybe those opportunities that are most aligned with your interests and what you're excited about is best. Um, the second question here is what transferable skills do graduate students inherently do that may be invisible but might be important for us? I mean, there is, you know, like as a TA, you get teaching experience. I was thinking um, might be also worth kind of reflecting on the those soft skills that you get as a graduate student, like project management, or, you know, doing... Um, when you're doing independent research, right, you really have to set your own timelines, uh, figure out your budget, right? How are you gonna maintain your project, whether it's your own support, like your assistantships or summer support, or, you know, that might motivate you to participate in different kinds of things to, you know, develop the funding that you need. I, I know all those different aspects of like project management, I think are, um, we often don't recognize that we have developed those soft skills just by necessity, even if we haven't received direct training in you know, project management. And then the last question, how would you suggest navigating mentorship beyond the primary advisor, particularly if the advisor is not leading those connections? Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I go back to that convening a session and I thought Leho's suggestion about like hosting a visiting speaker is also a good one. Like I saw my graduate students doing that at Syracuse University and I thought that was so smart. I didn't actually advise them on doing that, but they did. And I thought like they would say, hey, could we invite this person as a seminar speaker? You know, cause they were trying to establish connections. And I thought that was really savvy and smart. And I think that those connections were completely outside of anything I facilitated as a mentor and probably and did have lasting impacts. Like I still see those folks and I think, oh yeah, they established that connection way back when they invited that person as a speaker. So um, maybe it is these kind of you know opportunities to sort of invite someone um, or host someone or something as you know a way to have kind of a warm informal initial contact and establish some personal relationship that you can kind of follow up with when you see that person at at meetings or or whatnot. So maybe others have ideas to share. Maybe I'll follow up on that last point. The the how do you navigate that mentorship um, if your advisor isn't leading those connections? Um, I think Laura sort of mentioned in her in her last statement this idea of going to professional meetings, and several of us have brought up, oh, there are these different professional meetings that are happening. Um, who doesn't love to get an email saying, hey, do you want to grab coffee in your inbox? I've I've read your paper about X and I'm I'm just wondering if you have a little bit of time to talk, or I'm really curious about your experiences with X. Um, 
the majority of us will be very excited to see an email in our inbox and and like who who doesn't love to talk about their experiences and share what they have learned um so just know as you're sort of looking to establish those relationships whether sort of at your own institution or outside of them it could be professional meetings it could be at your own institution just asking if someone um is open to grabbing lunch um everybody needs those breaks through the, throughout the day don't don't feel um, I know personally, I always feel uncomfortable sending those types of emails thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm imposing on this person's busy schedule. Um, no, uh, as being on the receiving end of those types of emails is like warm, fuzzy feelings all around. Yeah. Um, I'll just add real quick in terms of like whether or not you recommend getting involved in service as a grad student, I've now done H3S for four years. Um, so I started while I was in my PhD and I started like early 2021. So COVID, everything was shut down, right? I wasn't seeing other students on campus at all. And so for me, like having H3S was like a really valuable community that I had um, because I just, again, everything was shut down, right? But like H3S operates completely online and through Zoom. And so for us, it was just like, yeah, this is, you know, this is just what we do kind of thing. And I've been really fortunate to like have made some great friends through H3S, but I also have made some really awesome networks through H3S too, including many of the panelists here. It's like, I've been had the opportunity to meet them through things that I've been doing with H3S. And so um, not saying H3S is the other, op the only option either. There's plenty of options, but for me as a grad student, like it was such a great way to develop networks with people outside of what my research realm was and also develop some really great friendships, um, especially because my undergrad friends that weren't doing a PhD or weren't in grad school, they didn't really understand kind of some of the wins and the woes that go into grad school. Whereas being as a grad student in a community like this, we could all kind of commiserate together and celebrate together. And so I just wanted to put that pitch in as to like whether or not doing service as a grad student is valuable. I found it super valuable. I'll just really quickly uh, uh, try to answer the invisible skill thing too, because I, that question may be coming from possibly like, how do I market myself after grad school? I'm not sure. But um, if it is, just remember that you are, you know, leading, developing and organizing research, which is those those words are really important in any job you look for um, in academia, but also outside, you know, so really think of all those components like that of what you've been doing the past you know, two to five years or six years, whatever, um, that you've done, like you can really sell, like I don't mean to sound like a salesperson, but you can sell those, which you kind of have to do to get a job. Um, so just yeah, remember that those are like invisible skills, but you are building those as you're going through your graduate career. So leadership, development, organizing, analyzing, and just all those things that can really contribute if you're going into, you know, government research, or if you're going into consulting, anything like that too. So Wonderful. Thanks for those answers. I think those are those are really helpful for the for the community of folks that we have on this call. So uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our our scheduled hour here um, for our panelists, and want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I was curious if we could kind of wrap things up with uh, with one last question of Do you have anything that that we haven't talked about that is kind of at the front of your mind from this conversation that would be helpful um, for for the community to keep in mind, um, whether that's how to engage in a service opportunity, you know, other kinds of um, non-traditional service to think about, um, any kinds of words of wisdom. Um, and as well, when you're when you're discussing that, if you want to share any of your contact information, if you're interested in being contacted by folks, but if not, feel free not to do that, but um, just give you the opportunity. So any kind of takeaways and um, would be great. Yeah, I'll I'll just say that right um uh right think of yourself as sort of a, a you know in a holistic way right um I have done service outside of of academia and and the university I was on the board of directors for um conservation voters for Idaho right which um 
wasn't really related to kind of my university role, but was very in, enriching and and I think played an important role where I live. So I think those non-traditional ro service roles can be um, important and, and a way to sort of add add depth. Um, I'll also say too, um, and I'm, I'm similar to Krista, I, I love and enjoy mentoring um, uh, early career folks. Um, maybe perhaps a couple of people on this uh, panel can attest to that. Um, but um, you know, feel free to contact me. Um, you know, if if you're interested in um, in just bouncing ideas off me. Um, I'll just step in here to keep things going. Um, I was just going to add, if you are interested in doing service for the National Science Foundation, um, I would really encourage you. You can always email a program officer. So if you find if you have a program of interest like hydrologic sciences or um, geomorphology and land use dynamics or low temperature geochemistry and you're interested in getting involved, just definitely send an email to a program officer. That's quite literally our job is to engage with the community. So, you know, you're helping us do our job if you contact us directly. Um, and also, if you're coming to the AGU meeting in Washington, D.C., Come, uh, come to the exhibit hall. We have a large NSF booth. You can meet program officers, and we have like a ton of lightning talks on like how to be a reviewer, why be a reviewer, how to participate in NSF. So, if that's something that's interesting of interest to you, um, please come by the NSF booth, and you know, hopefully, you know, you can you can you feel comfortable interacting with program officers at NSF, and rest assured that that's our job to engage with you and like help you figure out the NSF system and how you can participate. I guess one area to sort of put a plug in um, is thinking about those professional meetings that we've spoken a little bit about. Um, AGU sessions now specifically have a role for an early career co convener. So um, that's just something to be aware of. If you find yourself in a session that you think is really interesting, going up and introducing yourself to the conveners afterwards and letting them know that you know, that you're, you would be interested in helping to convene a session in the future is never a bad idea. Or as Laura suggested, putting together a session on your own is also a great idea. Um, and contacting um, some folks across different career stages and across different um, types of institutions or positions. Um, and then last, I'll throw out there, those AGU technical committees can sometimes seem like sort of a black box. Um, how to get in. So just know that there are websites that list who is the lead on each of those technical committees. You can reach out to those individuals if you would like to participate in those technical committees. Um, we are always excited to receive additional early career um, participants. Super good points, Krista. Um, and I want to say with the eight, with both of what you just said with the technical committees, and also with the uh, sessions at AGU, because I know I, I have a session I've worked in for like, it's the seventh year now. And one person came to us as an early career person, and she's now like just part of the group. So, I mean, it, it works, believe me. And that's a really cool move by AGU to have early career people being able to be like that fifth person basically as a convener. And um, yeah, it just works really well sometimes. And oh, oh, go ahead, Heather. One, one more quick thing, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's just always because I, I know I've emphasized this that I've, I, I kind of, it took me a while to get a network and that's where you get these opportunities. Just keep your eyes open. Uh, do like, like again, like Krista said, like you can reach out to people, you know, want to get a coffee. Can we meet up for a half hour? Just kind of don't be shy about that because it's tough for some of us who are introverts. You just got to do it <laughs> and it will pay off, believe me. Wonderful. Thanks for thanks for all the the sage wisdom and advice here. And um, you know, speaking for myself, but I I know um, some of you also have have been good mentors to me in some of these um, service opportunities. And 
Uh, it's always nice to to see you at AGU. And if you see any of us, feel free to say hello. I, I feel like everybody on this call is is very friendly and would love to talk to to anybody that comes up to them about um, opportunities or, or being more engaged in in individual facets of that. Um, I think this is maybe the the quickest and most on time we've been with some of these um <laughs> some of these sessions. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your insights. Um, the community really appreciates it. This would be on YouTube as well. And so um, if folks want to send this along, either our panelists or anybody that joined today, um, there'll be a link eventually to do that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I don't know if you have anything to add, Paige or Julia, but um, we really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thank you all again. These will be on YouTube and um, hopefully we can see many of you at AGU fall meeting with our booths 740 for quasi and 746 for H3S. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, Al. Thank you.